Welcome to Bible study. <laughs> now let's open the word of prayer. <laughs> Dear God, I just want to thank you. I just want to praise you for allowing us to be here. We're thankful that we can have another Bible study. And we pray now, dear God, that whatever is to be said and done, that you get all the honor and the glory and the praise from it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So we're on the last day of the push study. Um, the more and more I look at it, I'm like, wow, I didn't know it was going to blow up so much because I put it online because people asked me to put it online. And on a average basis, we have about 50 persons watching it. <laughs> online? I was like, oh, okay. So... It's reaching person, so that's what's happening. Now push, pray until something happens. As a child of God, the push must become a part of your Christian journey. It must become a part of your Christian journey. I mean, if you don't do it, if you know, I've always heard people say, you know, if you are a child of God and you're not praying consistently, something is wrong. Because if you're not talking to God, then probably you know, you're not going to have such a good relationship with Him. So you need to be careful. Thank you for coming. <laughs> you're right I'm on sorry time. I'm late. <laughs> no, you're right on time. We just, this is the first words. <laughs> right? <laughs> Secondly, we realize when you push regularly, whether it's for yourself or for others, it strengthens your relationship with God. And so pushing regularly is good. And I don't know anybody that doesn't want to strengthen their relationship with God. I've always said it to persons. You don't want to strengthen your relationship? That sounds weird. If you're a child of God, you want to strengthen your relationship with God. So the pushing regularly allows you to strengthen your relationship. Pushing will lead to a spiritually mature Christian living a victorious Christian life. You know... I've always heard a lot of Christians, I don't know what to do. It's like every day the devil has them beat down. <laughs> and I'm like, every day the devil is beating you up. Something is wrong. And I've always said, to, you know, I've said this to somebody. I said, listen, if you are a child of God and you can't tell me one good thing God has done for you, then he don't like you. <laughs> I don't believe that though. But if you are a child of God and every day your life is just crap. <laughs> basically mm -hmm. nothing good has ever happened to me i pray that nothing and god doesn't do anything for me then obviously god doesn't like you and i don't believe that so i believe there is something else in your life why you're not connecting with god so don't play on the premise that god don't like you as some people have it to say because if you're a child of god he loves you as a matter of fact if you're not a child of god he still loves you yeah. so if you're saying god has never done anything good for you the only conclusion I can come with, he don't like it. So I don't know. <laughs> but that's not true. So stop saying that. <laughs> Apart from using the push, it comes with one major responsibility. And I always tell everybody, you learn about the push. It's a wonderful strategy in your Christian life. And you use it. But it comes with one major responsibility. And it's this. You now have to teach others how to push. You aren't, you aren't learning all of this thing just to keep to yourself. I've always tell a person, when you come to God, and you become a child of God, God never saved you for you to sit in church and say, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. He saved you so you can tell other persons about him. Tell them why you became a Christian. Share your experiences so they can meet with God too. So if you believe you're supposed to sit in church and not tell anybody, <laughs> Something is wrong. Church is outside of the four walls, not just what you see every Sunday. So we need to teach others how to push. God always wanted to have a relationship with man. That's God. He always wanted to have a relationship with man from the beginning of the word. That's what God was doing. Having a relationship with us. So he never wanted us to be on one side and him on the other side. So communication was very important to him, right? The relationship, as I said, is strengthened by prayer and the life, all right, and the life we have. So the more we pray, the more we're what? Communicating, and the more our relationship with God is strengthening. So I always tell persons, if you're married to somebody, or whether you're not married to them, or somebody is close to you, but you never talk to them, I don't think you're really close with that person. <laughs> I don't think the marriage is going good if you are married for 50 years and you never talk to the person. You know, 
Do you know anything about your husband? No. No. <laughs> Only married him for 50 years, but I don't know nothing about him. I married him. I'm like, Fine. something is wrong with that relationship. <laughs> right? But they connect with that sigh. They connect, they connect with that look. It's like, connect with the look? <laughs> no, I still you don't know anything. Listen, my grandfather and my grandmother had that weird <laughs> marriage relationship. I don't know how they worked it out. But she knew everything about him. So at some point in time, she talked to him. <laughs> I, probably when I wasn't there when they were younger, but she talked to him because she knew what he liked to eat, she knew all his favorite stuff and things like that. He would remember her birthday and all. So they must have talked somewhere on the line, right? But I can tell you, if they wanted their relationship to be better, they should be communicating. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing here, right? Now when Jesus walked the earth, he was the greatest teacher. I love Jesus because Jesus was very practical. You know, unlike some persons here you know that just say things and make up things sometimes when they're teaching, Jesus was practical, you know. He always hit the nail on the head. Yeah, we're gonna stone her, Jesus. You're gonna stone her. Yeah, what she oh she committed adultery. Yeah, she was sleeping. Oh she was! Oh my, yeah. Yeah, we should stone her. But hold on, let me write something. And when he wrote on the ground, everybody walked away. If you never sinned before, you know, cast the first stone. <laughs> I love that. He just is a wonderful teacher. But one of the things I also love, and I don't want people to forget, is that in his teaching, he taught us how to pray. That is something we forget a lot. And then that is something that some people love, because guess what? Everybody loves to talk about our Father prayer. Because this is the model he gave us in the Bible. And so, let me read it. It says, this then, reading that account from Matthew, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So Jesus was teaching his disciples and other persons how they should pray. And I always bring this prayer back every now and then because I want people to understand what it's all about. But people don't understand that this is not a simple prayer. <coughs> they think this is just a simple mode Jesus gave them all to pray. It's really a complex prayer. But you have to break it down to find out how complex it is. So Jesus didn't just give us shallow water in prayer. He gave us a big deep water to go in and then he wants us to graduate from this. <laughs> he started us off deep. Let me show you. First thing it says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. First thing we notice that Jesus was saying here, we need to approach God with reverence and respect because he's a holy God. I don't care how many years you've been a Christian. I don't care what position you have in the church. I don't care if you're the pastor of 10 million churches. <coughs> you're still insignificant to God. <laughs> so approach him with reverence, approach him with respect. You know, I actually saw a particular person one time look up in the ear and actually curse God out. I was like, ooh, you're a brave boy. <laughs> he was a brave person. But I can tell you, his life has never... It was terrible before, but after that, it never got better. It's like God gave him a life of suffering. And his life, he was just... The last time I saw him, you know, I, when I visited Jamaica, I saw this person sleeping on the sidewalk and you know he was just all strung out, coked out, every out you could think of any drugs and he was there and I pulled up and I'm like who is this and I looked it was the same guy I said oh his life is never going to be the same so reverence and respect to a holy God because you're nothing to God don't forget that so be humble when you come before him then it says your kingdom come your will be done on earth this is actually saying, God, you have sovereign power. When it says your kingdom come, in other words, no matter what takes place, God's kingdom is going to come. Whatever he said in his word is going to be fulfilled. We can't stop it. His kingdom is going to come. <laughs> so that means he has sovereign power and we should recognize that. And it says your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, something else is going on and all that going on. So we should be seeking his will. So we should be asking God, what is it that you want me to do here on earth? 
don't think it's all just, you know, okay, God, you're coming for your earth. I'll just sit back with folded arms and wait till everything happens. No, we need to seek his will so we know what he wants us to do. Then when we go down further, it says, give us today our daily bread. Now, this is the one that has been messed up. Because every time when you go to church, they tell you give us their daily bread and they tell it's like, like it's food. It ain't talking about food. <laughs> you know, everybody mixes this one up and think it's actually just talking about food. It's more than that. It's actually petition and ask him what you desire of him. Now, some people are like, well, Pastor, I think you messed that one up. All right, good. I'm glad you said that. Wasn't it Jesus, that same one, that said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God? Then when he tells you here that you should ask for your daily bread, and then he tells you in another one that you should not live by bread alone, isn't that contradicting? That means he wasn't talking about food. <laughs> You see, because people have challenged me on this one, you know. And I love it. I love when they challenge me. I say, well, let's see what Jesus said. So he's talking about here. He said it before. We should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. So if we're seeking his will, and we're asking what we desire of him, he'll daily fill us and tell us what he wants us to do. He'll tell us how we should live day by day. If we read his word, then we'll be getting his daily bread spiritually to fill our bodies and what we should do and how we should live. So when he says, give us to this day our daily bread, we're going to be talking with him. All of this is talking about communication, you know. So if we're talking to him and asking what you desire of us and all of those things and bringing questions to him and stuff, he's going to answer us. He's going to give us our daily bread. So that is what he was talking there. Every word that proceeded from the mouth of God, that's what we, that's our daily bread. And then he went on to say, and forgive us our debts, right? Very easy part here. Confession, right? Asking his forgiveness for ourselves. Many times when I get up in the morning to do that early morning prayer, I always ask God for forgiveness. Because sometimes I don't know if I didn't mess up or did anything wrong. And people now asking me to pray for them. I don't want to go and pray to God about the things that you did or anybody else did. And I got sin in my life. <laughs> then I'm just wasting my time. <laughs> I need to confess my sins before. Get things right with God. Before I start praying for anybody. Even myself. So that's what I make sure I do. But I love God when he says this. And we also have forgiven our debtors. That means he gave us the other side of the coin. Forgiveness for others. And praying for others. So in other words, he's not asking you to, to for the other person to fix it with you. Even though the other person still don't like you. <laughs> You're supposed to still forgive them and fix it spiritually. Doesn't mean the situation is fixed. They might not talk to you. But you're supposed to still forgive them, still be praying for them, forgive them. So in other words, they owe you a debt. In this one, he went to the extreme. It's not fixed. They owe you, but you still should forgive them. That's why I said that. So when, the other day I was thinking about it, there was somebody that did something for me. Now I thought I was old news by now. You know, somebody carried my name a little bit in Jamaica and said some things about me and some stuff that I did. And I kind of heard it back. I thought I'm still used. No, I thought everybody forgot about me. <laughs> so I actually got the person on the phone. And someone that I love dearly. So, you know, I'm talking to the person. But I'm like, God, as a man of God, I need to call them out on this. You know, I can't just sweep it under the rug. So I said, such and such and such. And the person said, oh, you gone down back that road. Poop, poop, and gave me dial tone. I'm like, wait a minute, how do you want that? Give me dial tone. <laughs> It's like I did something wrong. And I didn't do anything wrong. Well, you know, I had to pray. and I, you know, Because I was getting upset. <laughs> I don't know about you. But when someone does do something wrong and then you talk to them in a calm manner and they get upset on you, I don't know if you're all like me and that, oh, God, forgive me. No, I was upset. Because <laughs> I didn't do them anything. But started to pray and God has relieved that for me and I've forgiven the person. I continue praying for the person. I'm praying that our relationship will be restored. Because right? it's somebody that I love, but they just wronged me. <laughs> but it 
says we should forgive our debtors. So the person owe me, but I'm forgiving them anyway, right? And then it says, and lead us not into temptation. This right here is talking about remaining faithful through trials and tests. So things going to come your way. Don't follow them when they preach in the sermon that come to Jesus and everything will be all right. I challenge pastors on it. Are you saying if I give my life to Jesus, everything will be fixed? Yes. You won't be broke anymore. You won't be this anymore. You won't be. So if you come to Jesus, everything is fixed. And they say, yes. But I said, but when I read the Bible, it tells us when we get closer to him, the devil going to come at us more. We're going to have more problems. You're going to have more challenges. We have more challenges, but he said he'll be there with us to see us through it. I'm like, you're teaching something else that the Bible doesn't say. And then they get upset with me, of course, and doesn't like. But the Bible never taught, come to Jesus and everything will be okay. Never taught that. It says, come to Jesus and the devil will be following with his minions to tear you down. But Jesus is going to stand with you. That's what the Bible taught. Right? So... Lead us not into temptation, remaining faithful through trials and tests. And then, deliver us from the evil one, right? Which is, of course, the guy that follows us, the devil. So, he says, you know, you need to pray for protection, for strength against the devil. Because he's not going to give up. If you are a child of God, you know, the devil doesn't give up on you. He always has something going on in your corner. I always tell Christians, if your life is all so sweet every day mm -hmm. as a child of God and you have no problems, that means you're probably a secret agent for the devil and don't even know it. Because <laughs> you should be facing something. Something should be happening. I'm not saying you're going to be upset. You get what I'm saying? But I'm saying something's going to come your way that you're going to say, oh God, I need to pray about this or something. You mean the devil doesn't bother with you? Why? If he, if he stop bothering me, I'm going to get upset. <laughs> and I'm going to start suspecting myself. Probably I'm doing his will. That's why he don't bother with me. He should try. I mean, he should take a break and then come back, but he should try. Keep on trying because we are children of God. Right? So protection, strength against the devil. Right? So we need to understand, as we said, we didn't get a simple format how to pray. This is the, the least that Jesus gave us. And it's not simple. Think on that. He gave us this, and it's not simple. And then there's higher levels of this. So this is where he wants us to start. Wow. So think about that. So to teach someone to push, you have to learn these things. You have to believe in it. You have to have experience in it. You have to be patient in it. And you need to put yourself out there as a witness. Now, if you're not ready to do these things, then probably you shouldn't be teaching anybody. <laughs> Get into it first before you start doing it. And we're going to look at all of these and you'll see why. First one, believe in it. Now, don't go around telling people about the push when you yourself is not convinced it works. Don't go around telling, oh yes, I'm telling you. Yes, you, you having problems? Oh yes, just pray to God. Listen fast for seven days and pray to God and he'll work it out and you're telling persons and you yourself don't even you, don't, you know you're just trying to help out somebody encourage them but if you don't believe it don't work don't do it keep it to yourself you know why this is why this can cause more harm than good it sounds awful but it's the truth it can cause more harm than good because listen if you don't believe the push works Right, and then you tell somebody to go and push, and you don't believe in it, and then you didn't know what to tell them because you, you know, you know, you don't believe in it, so you didn't tell them how to do it properly or whatever and stuff, and they said, but I went and I prayed for a week and nothing happened, and they're like, so what do I do? And you're like, I don't know. That's why I didn't want to take this God thing up. I don't believe in God and whatever. The person can be totally turned off from God because he didn't know what you were doing. Worse. If you were just trying to be nice and say something to the person, trying to encourage them, and then you tell them how they should push, and when they do it that way, you realize, oh, well, I really don't know what I told them, they're going to just turn away from God. So if you don't believe in it, right, and you're not convinced it worked, don't go around introducing it to people. 
Don't go around telling everybody, pray until something happens. Does it work for you? Pray until something happens. <laughs> don't tell persons if you're not convinced it works. Because they're going to say, then if you don't believe in it, why should I do it? And it's your God. You get what I'm saying? So don't do it. The next thing is, don't go around telling persons if you don't have experience in it. Don't be telling people about the push and you have no experience for yourself. I'm telling you, this push thing works. And they're like, really? Yes, you can pray and move God's hand. Wow, how do you know? Well, my pastor told me a story. Okay. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you, but I don't know your pastor. I know you. Tell me how it worked for you. experience with God doing something for you then don't go around telling other persons experience I tell other persons experience you know why because after they say I don't believe that and then they say did it work for you I'm glad you asked <laughs> then I share my experience and then they're like oh oh so I don't never start with my stories never <laughs> I start with other person's stories Right? But if you don't have any experience in it, how are you going to tell somebody it works and you're convinced? I know you have faith and all, but this other person might not have any. They might be all spent out. And so you have to have some experience in it to tell persons. Right? An experienced pusher will know how to lead and guide someone who is just starting. Because this person might be all tapped out of their faith right now. It could be a Christian. It could be a non-Christian. And they're going through some stuff now, and you have to know how to guide them, right? You also, a, a, a pusher also needs to know what type of push is needed for someone to get things done. You know, they might tell you their situation, and when you heard it, you're like, okay, you know what? Let's take some time and fast before we can do anything else. Sometimes you have to know that. But if you're experienced, you would know that. There are times when people come to me with certain situations and I just say, you know what, I, I, need, to, I need a couple of days. Let me take some days and fast for you. And you fast too. Before I even start crying out. Because sometimes some things need to be moved with fasting and prayer together. Sometimes you need to work them both together. And you know, you got to be doing different stuff. So, if you don't know what kind of push is needed, if you're not an experienced pusher, bring them up to somebody else that knows what they're doing. But don't do these things and, and get the people in trouble. An experienced pusher reminds the person of obstacles that can block their push. You know, someone is there praying, praying. I'm not hearing from God praying, praying. I hear from God. Many times when I'm going to pray with persons, sometimes I say, we want to hear from God right now. They're like, yeah. So, and I say, is there anything in your life that we need to set straight? And they're like, what? Okay, you have any sin you need to confess? <laughs> Let's put it clear. Because guess what? I'm there trying to reach out to heaven and you know you're not living right with God and you want to hear from him. The prayer line is blocked. So sometimes an experienced pusher need to say, you know what? Yeah, you didn't go to church for 20 years. But let's ask forgiveness for that because the Bible says we put that under and let's reach out to God now. You're coming to God with confession. So you sometimes you have to tell people these things. Right? Now be patient in it. Don't, please, 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 please. Don't be telling people the timestamp on a push. Because this is not the mail service. <laughs> yes, your push is on delivery. It should be here Thursday afternoon. <laughs> Don't do it. Don't listen. I gotta tell you this short story. This is in my family now, but I didn't call any names this morning. Calling any names tonight. I have to think of the stories before I tell them, you know, because, you know, my son is here and he knows everybody. <laughs> so, there's a particular situation happening in our family. And so, the family member called me up and said, Mario, I need you to pray with me because I don't see the situation working out. And I need to hear from God if it's going to work. And so, you pray, I pray, and I'm hearing from God. The person came back to me and said, Mario, did you hear from God? No. Nope. As far as I know, God said, it ain't going to work out. That's just it. So we were both here. Anyway, some of our other family members heard about it, took it on themselves, bonded together in prayer, and came back and called up that other family member and said, Listen, the Lord says, thus says the Lord. And 
I talk like the prophets of old. The Lord says, this is what shall happen and your situation will be fixed by the end of the month and this is what is going to happen. And so the person said, really? I've been praying to God and I never heard that. So the person dialed back, Mario, Mario, such and such called me and told me this is what the... Did you hear anything from God that I don't know about? I said, no, God said, as far as I know, God said it ain't going to work out. <laughs> so it's been like probably a number of years now. We're still waiting at the end of the month. <laughs> <laughs> Month, next month. Yeah, so don't, don't go around telling persons, you know, like you're the prophet of God, you know, and put a timestamp on the push, and God didn't give you one, right? You don't know. We need to remember this that every push is according to God's timing and will, not mine. Because many persons believe, because pastor is praying, it's going to come quicker. Mm -mm. That's one thing. I don't tell the big guy when to move. I ask him, please move. But I can't tell him when to move. Because again, remember, I'm insignificant too, just like everybody else. That don't mean God don't love us. I'm using the word insignificant so we can understand we're all on a level playing field. We're all ants before him. You get what I'm saying? So, because some people believe, oh yeah, get, get, get that man. And everything will be working out fine. And you'll, you'll get it quicker through him. Really? It's all according to God's timing and will. Exactly, right? And so we need to know that. Remind them that God speaks and they should listen. Because many times people don't hear what God is saying because we're too busy praying. <laughs> now praying is good. But when we are praying, we should be what too? Listening. Remember God gave us one of this and two of this. But we use this <laughs> twice and use this once. <laughs> I don't know why. So we are praying to God and he's speaking and we don't hear, you know, and so many persons are out there giving timestamps on when, and some of them even telling God too, God, I need it by this. Now sometimes I do that. But that doesn't mean he works all the time for me. It's that Mario, you gotta just get over <laughs> yourself. <laughs> Is that what happened this time? Sometimes I, you know, you know how many times I told him my family will be here? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. oh yeah. <laughs> Next Sunday they say, are they coming? Yeah. That, Seven years. <laughs> you know how many Christmases I said, this is the final one, God. You've got to do it this Christmas. <laughs> this is going to be your first Christmas in the United States together. Woohoo! <laughs> yeah. So, remind them, God always answers prayer. Yes, no, and wait. Listen, this is one of the biggest problems in Christendom. Because we want to hear only yes. You know how many times I said, God, this is it. Yep. You're sending them come. Yes, yes, yes. I remember persons came to me. God told me your family is coming to this year and they're going to be here. And I'm like, oh, yes, yes, yes. And God says, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> you see, we only hear what we want to hear. And so God answers. And many times we don't hear what God says because we're only want to hear. We love the yes bracket. Every child of God loves to hear yes from God. Then, wait. If anything, wait is not too bad because that means it's coming. You know? Mm -hmm. But nobody wants to hear no. And sometimes God says no. You push and God says no because there's a reason why I say no. But we don't want to hear that. So we got to be careful. And no maybe. Eh? Maybe? No, maybe. God, there's no maybes with That's God. Right. He already maybe. knows his decision. Right. <laughs> so there's no there's maybes. No maybe. Yeah, you know, and that's the funny thing. Many persons believe God says maybe. How can God right. say maybe? Right. He's God. Ain't no maybe. It's right. yes, no, yes, wait. Maybe. And the wait could maybe still mean a no enough. Because the maybe wait could be this. wait because this is not for you. I have something else for you over here. Mm -hmm. So it's like wait, this is not the time. You know? And then it turned out to be a blessing. Huh? Turn out to be a blessing. It's like, you know, downfalls and it's like, why, why, why? And then later it's like, that was a blessing. And it was, guys, amen. Like, yeah. That's what I'm talking okay, about. Just, that that is what I'm talking about. Mind. So, the last one is put yourself out there as a witness. Now listen to me with this one. If you're not willing to go all the way with the individual, right? Then recommend to them someone who will. So if you're not willing to go all the way, because you're not sure about this thing, you told them about it, and you're not sure to go all the way with them, the safest thing 
bring them to somebody, bring them to your pastor, bring them to another mature Christian. Mm -hmm. But don't just leave them high and dry. Because that's not good, right? That's not good as a child of God. You might have to share personal experience for people to believe you. There was this one time I was at school and this one lady was troubled. There was something happening in her life and I could see. And I was there and, you know, watching her. And after class, I stayed back and started to talk with her. And, you know, usually people say to you, you don't understand. <laughs> And I said to her, I understand. And she's like, no. You. And I started to pinpoint certain things and tell her where she was coming from. And she's like, how do you know I was talking, thinking about abuse was my problem right now? I said, because I can understand because I too was abused. And so abused person can pinpoint another one right out there because we understand. <laughs> and so she could listen to me. I could spend time with her in prayer. People come to Bible college and everybody think everything is okay. No. All sort of people going through stuff. So abused persons even come to Bible college too. So I'm telling you, sometimes you have to share some experiences with persons. And then when they listen to you, then you can start introducing certain things to them. Push and praying and all of that. But if you're not willing to go all the way with them, I don't want nobody to know my business. No, I don't want nobody to know my father. Lick the snot out of me. No, I ain't telling nobody that. Then leave it alone because you might be doing more harm than good. Listen, sometimes you might have to help them push. So in other words, you're like, I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to be your prayer partner. You're going to help them. Sometimes you got to do that because some persons are weak at that point in time and you have to help them. But you might even have to go harder. You might have to take the challenge to push on their behalf. Because guess what? Sometimes... You have to prove God for somebody. And so God might put you in a position because he has used this mouth many times. You know, I've taken on some challenges most of the time. And most of the times I, I want, because I'm not a boastful person. But anytime God wants me to do something, he's like he just presses a button in the back of my mouth. When somebody says something about God, I get very boastful. Well, I know God can do it. And I challenge you that he can. <laughs> and then after I say that, I say, did I just say get myself in trouble but I tell persons when you bet on God you can't lose so I still haven't lost one challenge yet because when God says to do something you just gotta do it right so sometimes you might have to take the challenge to push on behalf of some persons now this is the thing the push is a witnessing tool to both Christians and non-believers sometimes it's to bring somebody back to Christ you know that has been strained or in depression or stuff like that and sometimes it's to introduce somebody to God because they don't believe in the power of God and when they see the power of God work through you doing the push with them then they meet with God and they are there for life I can't tell you how many persons that has happened with right so you need to understand that and you need to understand when you teach it you have to be ready listen to this to use some crazy faith to prove to others who God is. Oh my Lord. Now crazy faith is that one. Let me tell you what crazy faith is. Crazy faith is that when Elijah, remember Elijah the prophet, when he took on 450 of them, and they call in on their God and he's the only one over here, on Mount Carmel, and they said, whoever fire going to come from, from heaven, Crazy faith is that same Elijah going up to the king and say, Hey king, let me tell you something. <laughs> it ain't gonna rain until I say so, because God told me to tell you that. <laughs> That's the crazy faith I'm talking about sometime to prove to others that God is real. Right? And so you'll have to do that. And so we come to story time. <laughs> and I entitled this one The Bicycle versus the Car. <laughs> This, that's me on the bicycle. Look at all that hair on there. Yeah, I find it. That's me with hair. <laughs> My younger days. <laughs> so this one is the bicycle versus the car. Now, let me tell you something about this story. This was one of the stories where I decided to be at Elijah. And put my foot in my mouth, but I was going by God leading me. And sometimes when after he tells me to say some stuff, I like, did I just say that? So, been in America, just here for a 
couple of months realized I can't get into school yet because my paper is still going and so I'm there working and things going winter is coming mm -hmm. uh -oh. Let me tell you something about a Jamaican and winter. I was smart. I used to come to the United States and visit all the time. I've been coming since the 80s. But I always get out of Dodge before winter. Because <laughs> I, man, you don't have to tell me twice. By October, I'm out of here. Whatever vacation I'm at, I am passing October, man. And I come in before May. Because I don't want to see no, no, I want no snow. I don't want no cold. I'm good. Right? And so now I'm here. And I can't leave because they're doing the paperwork and winter is coming. I don't got no car, I don't got no bicycle, and things are going. And it looks like, based on what they see on the weather report, this is going to be one of the worst winters. <laughs> so I was like, whoa, what's going to happen? So I went downstairs and I started reading my mm -hmm. Bible and I was reading my Bible and I came across the story of Elijah. And so Elijah went to King Ahab and said, it shall not rain. And it didn't rain for three years. Three years, this man told the king, and it didn't rain for three years. And I'm like, wow, what a, st wow, this is awesome. What? I can't ask God, and it doesn't rain. Why can't I ask him for it not to snow? <laughs> and I'm like, I can do this. Elijah did this, I can do it. So, Listen, I'm not joking. I got to serious prayer, sometimes even fasting. This is a couple of months out of winter now. But I prayed specifically. I said, God, I want to see the snow, but I only want a dusting. <laughs> that means it ain't supposed to pass the tip of my shoe. I just want to see the dusting and see what the snow looks like. But I don't want nothing because I don't need snow until I have a car that I can drive and stuff. Because remember, I don't have a car, so if I want to go grocery shopping, I got to use the BMWs. Better man walk. <laughs> That's what I use. I have nothing else. So if I need to go grocery shopping, nearest grocery store, I put my backpack and I start walking in BMWs here. <laughs> so that's what was happening. So I was there and I started praying. So of course, the house that I live in, everybody there is a Christian. And so, I don't know how it got out of my mouth that I was praying about that. And they laughed me the school. They were like, you were saying what? That God should hold up. <laughs> Mary, I knew you were crazy, but you're way out there now. And they laughed at me, laughed at me, laughed at me. I said, okay. But I can bet you that God will do this for me. Did I just say that out loud? I was thinking it. <laughs> but it came right out of my mouth. And they're like, we'll see. I said, we'll see. I put it in God's hands. And so every day, the news report, it's going to be the worst winter that Maryland has seen for a long time. And every day they laugh at me. Yeah, Christian boy. See how God going to stop this snow from coming. You see that? Look, it's coming from the Pacific Ocean and all they're showing me all the different weather reports. Anyway, the first snow that was supposed to hit, they had everybody batting down everything. Listen. We woke up the next morning, no snow. <laughs> I'm like, what? Throughout the entire, almost all the entire winter, no snow. Other places getting snow, but my area, no snow. And then I remember going to my bed one night, I said, God, remember I want to see the dust thing. <laughs> woke up the next morning, and they said, hey, Mario, wake up. I said, what is it? They say snow fell last night. I ran out, dust thing. <laughs> Just enough to write my name on the concrete in the road. Mario was here. <laughs> and I was like, thank you, Jesus. And, I'm and they're like, wait a minute. You did say that. And so they're looking at me like, hmm. I said, I told you, don't mess with God. And he ain't finished yet. There ain't going to be no snow until Mario get that car. <laughs> so, you know, everything finished. Started school. Now I'm in Lancaster Bible College. Of course, now it's spring. And you know what happens to us Christians after we get our way for a little while. What we do? We forget. So Mario not praying so much about snow anymore because sun is shining and the birds are singing. Typical human being, right? So I'm there <laughs> doing Lancaster. Everything is going good. But now I need to get to the grocery store. And it's further than it was before in Maryland. And I'm like, oh, snap. Oh, my God. Do this now. So of course, I'm walking. Sometimes I got one backpack at the front here and one backpack strapped around the back. 
and walk in with my stuff because I don't want to make this journey twice. <laughs> and he's going to the dollar store, that's where I shopped. <laughs> so I'm coming back and stuff and somebody saw me and said, Mario, man, I saw you on the road. That's a whole lot of stuff you're carrying. I'm like, I have no choice. And he says, you know what? Tomorrow when we go to work, because he worked at the school, I want you to see me. I got something for you. I'm like, oh, sure. So I came to school that morning, and this is what I was presented with. A bicycle! I felt like I reached, I arrived. <laughs> I felt like this was the best gift anybody. It was like gold to me. I'm telling you. And so I'm feeling so good. And now listen to this thing. I washed the bike, shined it up. I know it's a little bit old, it's not new. Washed it up, shined it up, took a picture, and said, I'm going to send this to my son. He's going to be so proud of his daddy, he got a bike. I know he remembers this. <laughs> and so I sent the picture to him. I said, hey, Vicario, look, your daddy got a bike. He texts me back. Yeah, I see it. But couldn't you get a man's bike? Yeah. That's a lady's wheel. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. I was, I was thinking that the whole time. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I got the text, I was like, <laughs> I was just so humble that I was like, okay. okay. <laughs> he just like, he just, wow. <laughs> and so, I never said anything more. Took my bike and I started riding. So I did miles on this girl here. I did miles on her. She There's was no rack on the going back good and stuff. Yeah, I got to all my... I got to... Now I could start shopping at Walmart because Walmart was further than the dollar store. It was just a couple miles further down the road. So now I'm riding to Walmart. So I'm like, yeah, I'm going good now. But anyway, this bike's got a problem. It had rust. If you notice the rim over there, you see the rust on the top. Mm -hmm. And so right where the lever is at the neck, it was rusting. And the rust went all the way at the top. One day I was riding and the handle went, <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, oh, and I tried everything to fix it. Couldn't be fixed because it was just rotting out. And so I'm like, where am I going to get a pipe? I wonder if they lend me their torch to cut it off and try putting a pipe in it. No, I never used that torch before. No, I, I, I don't want to lose my only road of, mode of transport. You get what I'm saying? And I'm like, oh, I don't know what to do. Then somebody saw me and said, Mario, you having problems with your bike? I said, yeah. He's like, see me tomorrow. I got something for you. I'm like, okay, what's this? So I say, bye, bye, bike. Bye, bye. <laughs> And then he gave me this one. <laughs> now when I watched this one, I took a picture and I said to him, I said, hey McCurry, I got another bike. He's like, okay, that's better. <laughs> so now I am on this bike. I'm way happy. I'm doing good. I thought I was doing miles on the other bike. I'm doing multiple miles on this one. Because now I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm on manly on a man's bike. I'm on a mountain bike. So I'm doing all of this and doing good. And then I real, as soon as I realize it's in the middle of the year. What a bit, middle of the year. What comes after the middle of the year? Fall, then what? Winter. Uh oh. I don't got no car. And so I'm at lunch one time and I'm talking to one person at the table and I'm telling him, man, I need a car. And he's like, me too. And I said, like, no, I really need a car. You don't understand. He's like, what do you mean? I said, I need a car that I don't own, that someone pays for all the parts, <laughs> someone pays for all the, the, th the things that come with it, the registration and all of that. The only thing I'm responsible for is to put on the parts that they buy and put gas in it. The guy looks at me and like, are you dumb? You want somebody to buy you a car that they give you the key and they pay for all the insurance, all of that stuff. And the only thing you do is put gas in it, and if there's parts to put on it, they buy it and give it to you, and you put it on? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Immediately after I finish saying that, he says, hey guys, come here, sit around the table, we need to talk about it. So there was a crowd around the table, and then they, he's telling them my prayer, and I'm like, and everybody's laughing at me. So of course, the button touches in the back of my head again, I say, but I bet you God can do this. <laughs> and everybody's like, Okay, Mario, God is going to provide you with a car that you don't own and that someone, you know, they're all Jared. This is Bible college. And I said, and on top of that, I already told him it can't snow until I get a car. Oh, oh, so now you control snow too. Oh, and they're all laughing at me. So I told him what had happened 
the year before, and they're like, well, that was just a coincidence. And I said, we'll see. I'm putting my foot down. God is about to do this. And they're like, they're all laughing at me. So we went on. Things got hard for me then, real hard. Couldn't find the money to go back to Maryland to teach youth group. And so they didn't see me for like a month and a half. And the pastor calling me and said, when are you coming? And I'm like, I just can't afford it. A bus ticket is just too much. And he's like, okay, okay. And so I said, you know, one of these days I'll come and resume youth group and all of that and stuff. So I'm there with my bicycle. And I realized that, you know, August running away, September rolling in. So I get back to my serious prayer. God, I need this car. And if the car ain't coming, no snow, just need dusting. So I'm back on prayer now. I'm back on serious prayer with God because I need this thing to be done. Then guess what happened? One day, they called me and I said, Mary, you need to come into work. Now remember, I'm just a temporary worker. I'm not supposed to. But nobody came into work that morning because it was freezing cold. It was supposed to be 30 degrees and then it fell below 30 degrees. And so they said, Mary, you need to come in to look at some of the heaters and all of that and stuff. Okay, I'm coming. Sorry. Got all dressed up. I went out and oh no, <laughs> went back in. And I went outside and I got my bicycle. And I got on the bicycle and I start pedaling because the school is about two, three miles away, and it's below thirty. You know the wind chill on a bicycle. And so <laughs> I'm riding, and then when I'm riding, the devil heard me complaining because I started complaining. <laughs> call me out to work on a bicycle, you know how cold it is, I'm complaining and I'm crying and I'm, you know, making a mess. Then the devil says, this is my opportunity. So the devil comes in and says, God don't love you. God don't honor you. When you were in Jamaica, you drove a car. And now you're in the United States and you're riding a bicycle. You left warm temperatures in Jamaica to come to the United States to ride in a cold, cold weather. Are you dumb? God doesn't honor you, because if he honored you, he would have not given you one bicycle and graduated you to another bicycle. And he started laughing at me. Oh boy, Mario got mad upset. I'm like, God, yeah, you know I need a car. And I started, you know, I'm getting all, you know, getting all upset and I'm riding the bicycle. And there I was riding the bicycle, I passed this man, a little short man on his way to work. One foot in front of the other was so cold. And the Holy Spirit said, <coughs> look at him. At least you ain't walking. Wow. That humbled me. By the time I got to work, I just had to go in the bathroom and ask God to forgive me. And I thanked him again so much for that bicycle because I realized how much it meant to me. Because I knew if I had said to that guy, hey, you can have my bicycle to get where you are. He's like, thank you, buddy. Shoo! and went down the road on that. And so I said, no, I need, so I made sure now I had to start pushing again. I said, God, whatever your will is, but I'm pushing for that car or no snow. Whichever one you want to work, that's okay with me. About two weeks later, I got a call from Maryland. Pastor said, you coming down this weekend? Pastor, I want to come, but I got no money. Don't worry, I'm sending you a bus ticket. Sure, I'm coming. So, you know, I got down the weekend and stuff like that. When I get down, he says, I got a surprise for you. I'm like, what? Then he goes inside and he takes out and he says, look. I'm like, what is that? It's the keys to the car. That car right there. I'm like, what? <coughs> and that's when he showed me this one. Da -da 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 -da. <laughs> 1994 Lincoln Town car. <laughs> look at that. And he says, listen some issues but we know it should run and drive if you can get this started we'll take care of the insurance we'll take care of all the paperwork if you need any parts just give us the bill we'll buy the parts and you're mechanically inclined aren't you I said yes I am then you put on the parts all you have to do is put gas in it and come back to us I'm like you pay the insurance yeah you pay for everything yep you you go to everything like yep all you have to do is put on so he says go and check it out tell me what parts you want I went and I checked though I got the parts, and he got the parts for me. They gave me the money. I got the parts. <laughs> Sunday after church, I was after church. I'm in my work clothes. I got underneath that car, and I fixed everything that needed to be fixed. And then I washed it. <laughs> and I said, to Lancaster, I owe silver. <laughs> and pastor's like, 
you're going right now? I'm like, yep, no better time to test it out than the present. The first test was over 200 miles coming back to Pennsylvania. <laughs> That's it. I, don't, I never met this car was wonderful, right? So you know Monday now when I'm at school. <laughs> of course I rode my bicycle to school. <laughs> It's a 1994 car now. This, this sucker here takes a lot of gas. I can't mess with it. <laughs> so I rode my bicycle to school. Lunchtime, I, you know, come on. No, no, sit here today. Sit, sit here today. You know, and you're like, what? So I got all those boys together and I said, okay. Remember when I told you what God was going to do? Oh, yeah, you're still on that? Oh, come on, Mario. So I said, this is what God has done. He has given me a car. They laughed at me. Mario, we don't think you're for a liar. Where is it? Where is the... Of course my bicycle was parked outside so nobody believed me. Mm -hmm. So I had to do it again the next morning. This time, when I called them and they all sat down, you're still on this, Mario? Look outside. They're like, whose car is that? That's the car I'm telling you about. They're like, you bought that? I said, no. Where should I buy it? I don't have money to buy a car. God gave me a car. That the only thing I'm responsible for is putting on the parts and putting gas in it. Everybody's jaw was like down on the, tour, the table <laughs> in the lunchroom. Are you serious? Did he, you're, you're not making it? I said, nope. I said, look on it. When they looked at it, they saw the church name. I carried the papers and everything. They saw that it was a gift from the church and all I was responsible for was to put in the parts on it and put gas in it. They were like, oh my gosh. I said, I ain't finished yet. <laughs> and he said, what? I said, get your snow boots on. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, Mario, listen, the weather is saying on the forecast, we're going to have a mild year. I said, get your snow boots okay. on. It's going to snow. I already talked to God. And it's, oh, so you're in charge of the weather. I said, unless God is a liar and I know he ain't a liar, this came before the snow. You shall see. That year we had so much snow, we had to hire back holes to move some of the snow to the back of the school. <laughs> Everybody that was sitting with me at that table can tell you about that story. And that is how I used the push to teach them by reality. And so many of them now, when things were happening in their life, they said, help me to push. Teach me to do this. I want this in my life. I want that. Many of them say, I don't want to just marry someone. I want a, a woman of God. I said, well, you got to push for her. Pray. And so many of them did this, all because of what happened with my story of saying, you know, I'm going to control the weather. Because I can't, but I know who controls it. And if Elijah can do it, why can't I do it? Because he talked to God too, just like me. So we need to understand that when we teach persons to push, right, they need to understand as twice as much as they are pushing, they need to listen more. So they push hard, they need to listen twice as hard. Because God will tell them stuff at times. God will tell you stuff to do. And it's going to look crazy and people are going to laugh at you, but you got to trust God. You got to trust God, especially when you're teaching a person that don't believe. Now, this was all Christian person, by the way. This is Bible college. As if Christian persons can be so unbelieving, Judge the person that don't believe in God, right? So you need to remember that. Many times God speaks and we don't hear, as I said, because we're too busy praying. So we're pushing and God says, I hear you, my child. This is what I want you to do. You want me to say what at the lunch table, God? I didn't hear that. God, please help me to get a car. <laughs> God's going to give you specific details to do things and we don't hear because we're too busy praying. Right? There are times he gives us instructions while we push to work things out for the benefit of him getting the glory. Listen, there was no doubt in anybody's mind that this was not Mario's doing. When I was in Maryland and we got the dust in, there was no doubt in anybody's mind that it was. And guess what? That house that I used to stay at, you know, I drove my car on there. I stopped and I went, boop, boop. Everybody went, whoa, are you a pimp now? You're in a cabin at what's wrong? And I said, I said, I'm God's pimp. <laughs> and they were like, where do you get this? And when I told them, they were like, 
but you did tell us that God was good. I said, I know. I said, I always bet on God and I never lose. Those, two of those guys, they're very close to me. They're not Christians. And they said to me, sometimes, man, I know I ain't a Christian, but I know God is real because I've seen him in your life. That's what they said to me. They have seen, and listen, when anything happens in their life, the first person they call is me. Because they have seen the push work. And so this is what we have to do sometimes, right? Sometimes we get the answer right away, but we fail to hear it, especially if it's not the answer we want. So we got to be careful when we're teaching persons to push, and God has answered. Let them know that God has answered, even if it's not what they want. Prayer is something given to us by God, right? We need to remember that. It is a direct communication line to Him. No need for an operator. Remember those days when you had to go through the operator? Or when you had the party party line, everybody heard your business? You don't know about the party line? <laughs> one on, one on, one on, one on, two on, yeah. Yeah. Nine, 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 nine or four. See, nine on. She remembers that. She, you remember the party line? That was worked a lot. Yeah. And everybody yeah. knew everybody else's ring. Yeah. One line, two short. Two short, one line. <laughs> and then it, then they go, if they wanted to know what you were doing, they, they pick up the receiver. Pick up the receiver and hear your conversation. Yeah. We didn't have, I didn't have phones where I was living, yeah. but my grandma yeah. lived in Kingston, and Kingston was on the cutting edge technology, so they had party lines. <laughs> So I saw party lines, I'm like, what's the use if somebody can hear your business? But yeah. So no need for an operator. We go directly to God. It is a tool in our Christian journey that has to be used. Don't put it on the back shelf. Don't put prayer on the back shelf. It has to be used. Right? It is a spiritual weapon. Remember, prayer is a spiritual weapon. It is our defense both spiritually and physically. I can't tell you how many times my life was in danger and because I cried out to God many times or for somebody else, he saved them physically. Think about that, right? The more we use it, the stronger our relationship is with God. And I can't stop stressing you want to take No, I got my... We need to remember that. So to wrap up this session, what have we learned about the push? Five sessions. We learned what is push, what is pray until something happens. And we learned everyone can pray until something happens. In other words, pastor don't have the monopoly on it. As some people think you have to go through the pastor. That's not true. Right? Any child of God can access this themselves. We learn we can push for ourselves. Right? We are going through stuff. We can go to God on it and push for ourselves. We learn we can push for others. Sometimes they don't even know we're pushing for them. But what we're going to do? Push for them anyway. And things change in their lives. Right? We learn what can block our push. Because there are different things that block the push. Sin can block the push. You know, we're not listening to God can block the push. All of those things. We also learn that we need to teach others how to push. So when we get experience and we have all this knowledge and we have used it for ourselves, we now can teach others. But I leave you with this to end the series. Very important. Know that you have learned about the push. What are you going to do about it? It's useless I come and spend five weeks and tell you about praying until something happens and then when all of you go, nobody praying. <laughs> So if you don't believe it, at least try it. Right? Put God at his word and try. Some persons are having situations in their lives medically. Some persons are having situations in their grandkids' life, their children's life. Start pushing for them. Because remember, there are other things that you can push for yourself. You can push for others. Start doing it. Challenge God and say, God, I want to hear from you regarding this. I mean, if there's something that you have and you're saying, God, this has been plaguing me for years and it's never been resolved. Say to God, you know what? I'm bringing this before you now and I'm not going to stop praying until something happens. I got one that I've been doing now for about eight years or more. And, you know, I keep calling the person. Has it gone through yet? No? Okay, I'm still praying. That's a long time. It's a long time. 
but there must be a reason why God has held on to this. And I've been asking why, you know, you didn't allow this thing to go through. There is a specific reason, and he'll tell us in due time. But he says, continue pushing. So, now that you learn about it, do what you can do and start pushing.